about writing, which is the last liberals, but mainly about the uh, book that uh, Michal Norman has created for the last, uh, the last artist book uh, that uh, go into the collection of Ivory Press and museums or other collectors. And I will not talk anymore. I leave you, both of you, and I think you have, so you, you begin. Thank you so much, Elena. And uh, it's uh, an incredible honor to be here uh, and have a conversation with Michael. And thank you all so much for being here. Before starting, I just wanted to say how important it is what Elena and Ivory Press are doing. Because I think um, if we look at that history, uh, books are, are so fundamental. They're fundamentally important. And it is something which um, I think is still not understood in the world, because in a way, when artists do books, and when artists do artist books, this is as important for them as an exhibition. However, we very rarely see in museum collections the book to be a protagonist. And I think it is incredible that here in Madrid, there is this extraordinary place, actually two places, it's Avery Press 1 and 2, which is really mostly devoted and dedicated to this idea of celebrating the importance of the book. It's for me a very important place where we can always return to see actually the history of the artist book. It's again something which is absent from most museums, the incredible history of artist books. It's throughout the centuries. I mean, all big movements in the 20th century. I'm from Zurich, the city of Dada. If it's Dada, if it's surrealism, if it's the neo avant-garde of the 60s, if it's Fluxus, all these artists always did books, very often books in collaborations with poets and novelists, something Michal has been doing a lot as well. We're going to talk about that as well. So it's really extremely important, this idea of Ivory Press celebrating books. And we should give a big round of applause to Elena Foster. <laughs> now, before we talk about the books um, and about the extraordinary writings and the extraordinary document, I wanted to begin with the beginning and ask you, Michael, and I'm really delighted that we can have our first public conversation here today. We had a wonderful conversation in your studio in Israel about 10 years ago. Um, and I wanted to ask you how it all began, because you uh, started in Tel Aviv. I wanted to ask you how you came to art, how art came to you, and maybe how the, what role the books played in all of this. I, um, I studied the cinema and television, and cinema and philosophy in uh, the Tel Aviv University. I, um, my boyfriend was a, an amateur photographer, and he decided to open a, a, a laboratory for photographers. And I said, that's very nice, I'll be your partner. And, but I was never interested in taking pictures or anything. I was really interested in philosophy then. Uh, but one day I, I decided to go into one of the classes and the teacher said, if you come to the class, you have to take pictures and next week you have to shoot two rolls of film and someone will show you how to make a contact sheet. And I, I did that. I, also I said, I'm really not interested. I just want to hear about it. I did that and I was struck to see something about myself that was sort of deep hidden coming across this recording mechanical tool. And I then discovered that there is an authority for the viewpoint of a person that comes across mediums like, like that. And I suppose that's how I started. And then it became a school, this place became a school, etc., etc. And one day I left. And you went to New York? I went to New York. And it's interesting because I'm always interested in, in mentors. I mean, I had great mentors when I grew up in Switzerland with Peter Fischler and David Weiss. Your mentor was Robert Frank. And um, I, I met Robert Frank once when he had the retrospective in London. And he talked a lot about this idea that um, a photographer, um, for a photographer really, it can never be a matter of indifference. And he also talked about this idea that Photography must contain the humanity, really, and uh, the humanity of the moment. It always is important that there is a humanity. But he said that this is not enough, because that is realism. Uh, and we always need to go beyond that. There needs to be, be vision. And I think that connects very much to your work. Can you tell us what you learned from, from Robert Frank? 
I learned, I, I think, you know, first of all, it was Robert who told me uh, you should go to America. He said, this place is too small for you. I remember this thing. He says, Israel, it's, you should come to America. Uh, and I, I remember that he was, he was not afraid to be uh, spontaneous. It was really, you know, that may, maybe probably after all these years when you wonder what is the most important quality of an artist, and I, I think it is you really need to be brave about a lot of things, you know, not to, not to make a mistake and not to be too rational and to go sometimes against, you know, other considerations of, uh, of you know, what is comil for and not comil for. And, and there was something about Robert that he was, uh, he was very curious about people. It was all for him a kind of an engagement uh, with people. And also, of course, all his place was, was, uh, was very, very poetic and, and at the same time very deep and very kind of precise and tough way of, of looking at, re at reality. Everything and the beauty in it, so. Um, and he, you know, he, we, we did collaborate first with, with some text on, on uh, movies that he did and um, he wrote the letter of recommendation for my visa and so on. <laughs> so there was that. But I, I remember going with him to Allen Ginsberg and to to you know, other people like that, some of his friends. And of course, we're here in photography, and you started with photography. So I was wondering, because I think it's always interesting where the number one is in the catalog raisonné, no? Because an artist has student work, and then at a certain moment, the catalog raisonné begins. What would be the number one in your catalog raisonné? What's the first work you felt where you had found your language you, you, you were happy with? It's an interesting question. I was a student at that time in the Academy of Art in Jerusalem, and we had different assignments, you know, like portrait, self-portrait, background, and you know, foreground, whatever. But I went one day to Herod Mountain in the desert. This is a mountain that King Herod built. It's four BC, six kilometers south of Bethlehem, and he ran. He ran away from Jerusalem because he was, um, yeah, even ADD. So, that, 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 that. so King Herod had to run away from Jerusalem, and he took five of his soldiers and some of the family, and he ran away in the desert. And then the, his opponents came and fought with him in the middle of the night, and. His mother had an accident, she fell off the horse, and he said to his soldiers, you know, I decided to die. I had enough of life. It's a long story, bit, but it's very meaningful. So he said, I'm, I'm, I'm decided to die. And they said to him, oh, King Herod, please eat something, take a nap, and let's talk later. So he ate something, he took a nap, he woke up and he says, okay, you know what? Now I decided to live, but I will live in this place. I will build a mountain. I will build my mausoleum, and I will build a, a fortress and a castle so I can see all around if somebody is coming to get at me. And I will call this place Herodion on his name. And there's something that, so he built an artificial mountain in the desert, and the whole story and question and idea of a place of you know, a place being a consideration, a markation of something in the middle of the space, and there was really nothing there. And so I went there one day uh, with my husband at the time, and it was the last point I could reach before it was the border, you know, the, the dangerous zone for me. And from that point, in a distance, I saw those cubic houses, which is Arabic houses. And from that point and on, I started to take pictures of those houses, you know, these cubes of houses. There were just a few of them. And every weekend, it is what I wanted to do. And every weekend, we had another deal. I'll go with you to your parents. I'll go with you to do this. I'll cook this for you. But I have to go Saturday to Herod Yon to the mountain. So these are the first, you know, squares, cubic squares. And he asked me one day, but we've been there before. Why do we need to go again? And what do you see there? And I said, you know, look at these structures. I don't know if there is anybody out there and if they are looking at me when I'm looking at them. 
that was that was the I, I think a lot of my work is in it. This is a very very beautiful story. And then of course you did a lot of photography and before we had a conversation over coffee with Ito Artist, a wonderful artist and photographer who is also here um, and who showed us his books. And uh, you, were say, you were talking about your beginnings in photography and said that at a certain moment you wanted to go beyond photography. Can you tell us about this epiphany? When, what, what happened and what triggered that? It was the war in the Gulf. I was in New York and it was the first war that Israel was involved with, which I was not in Israel, because you know, I grew up in Israel, and so I experienced quite a few wars and going to the shelter, etc. And so that was the first time that, in fact, my parents' house was hit by a missile. As luckily, they were in my farmhouse only one night, and so they didn't, get, they didn't get killed or something. But I stayed at home, and I was watching television. I decided I will be as if I'm in Israel, and wouldn't leave the house, only to get food. So I started to take photographs of te the television, which later on uh, became a series, uh, a whole series of, of works. And I was struck by the way the war was shown and, and um, you know, and uh, documented from a distance, and that kind of flattened reality. Uh, and especially there was this row of Prisoners, I don't know if you know if you recall it, there was rows of prisoners, and they were all like little dots, pixels, you know, broken up human, human beings. And the next thing I did, you know, it's kind of, anyway, I always was interested in this, how many pixels do you need to know that it's a person, is it, all of it. And the next thing I did is I went to a shop and I said I would like to get the camera, video camera with the longest telephoto lens. And then the first video happened. Can you tell us about the very first video? The first videos were I was at the Dead Sea and I stood in the roof of a hotel and I had a few guys floating in the water and I just were, was very interested in this kind of residue of human in the water and you know again that the fact that the subject and the background kind of emerged and those human marks and lines. And so, you know, usually one would go closer to something to, to see better. And from the beginning, I, I had this feeling that possibly you need to get further away and to also get away from the details. And that, th these were the first human figures which didn't have identifying details that, you know, I kind of decided to erase them and to go underneath that layer of details. And it's important because these figures, <coughs> very often people think that they're somehow computer generated, uh, but there aren't. It's always real people. Can you tell us about that process? Because it leads us also to the book. It leads us to many aspects of your work. It's always real people uh, you, you photograph and then from there. Yeah, you know, my, my work is an interaction with, with reality, and it's very important for me to always start with reality, with recording or collecting something from reality. But while recording, I, I make a point to erase a lot of identifying details. And it's not about wanting to get away from reality, but really to go underneath the, under the story, under the narrative, under all these details that sometimes, to me, are, are, could be even blinding. Um, maybe I will show you something that I, I yeah. showed before, uh, either from the Petri dish or from Time Left. That yeah, maybe it would be great to see images. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we, we, can, um, we can let you do your say or what you yeah, know. Yeah, so Panofsky okay. said yeah, so. the future is invented with fragments from the past. And, and history plays a very important role, history and memory. And I mean, we live in a digital age <coughs> where we have more and more information. Uh, and I was friends with the late Eric Hobsbawm, who, the historian who always said we need to protest against forgetting because maybe amnesia is actually somewhere very much at the car of this digital age. Uh, information doesn't mean that we have more memory, maybe we have less memory. And you, you have always worked with, with history. You get a lot of ins inspiration from books, uh, from history books. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Memory, protest against forgetting, and the influence from history books. I actually, the way you 
uh, studied me, I studied you before coming here. And it was, I'm very honored to, to talk to you. And it is also a moment in parentheses to say that I, when I walked in Ivory Press yesterday, I, I really had goosebumps. Just for, I, was, I really was moved just to walk into that place again, you know, with, with the devotion to books, to, to the collection, to writings, and to such a, you know, fanatic uh, team that would never give up any detail of something. So I go back to that, you know, um, of, of course, you know, I, I, I grew up in Israel, you know, you, you grew up with la la exposed layers of times, and everywhere you go you see footnotes of, 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 of um, other layers of time. And I'm always, I've always been very fascinated by, by that and also by the notion that you can really possibly have a dialogue with another layer of time. Sometimes I say I even see myself as another layer of time in making, um, especially in the field where I live, that I, I find ceramics, you know, old ceramics that go back and date the Bible times. So I'm, I'm very interested in that, but also there is always the missing information that is, is there, comes along with it. And as I started to say that I studied your interests, and I'm always interested in the, the te Tezarus, the book of synonyms. The book of Tezarus. Yes, Tezarus. So I brought, by chance, a definition of something that I, I thought really has to do with the books and with the topic. And, you know, there is a, a very nice definition of, you talk about memory, that memory is the ability to hold in the mind. And I, I think from the first men back then, from the first, the cave paintings, in my mind there was somewhere the notion that life is temporal, that it could end, that it could finish, not last. You know, there was an, a, an urge to, you know, to engrave it or to, you know, to, to, to recast it to an, a, a form and later, later on an object, later on a text in history. And, and there was that, you know, the feeling of all of humanity, the, the urge and the necessity to document ourselves, our culture, our history, our impression and so on. And so with that ability, memory ability to uh, hold in the mind, I have the two synonyms that I'm sure that you would really love. Uh, one is for memory, which is retrospection, reflection, recollection, awareness, consciousness, thought, and mind, a memory. But more interesting to me is the absence of memory, is the forget forgetfulness. And it is a disregard, missing, gap. I, I dropped some okay, omission. Chaos, neglecting, destruction, mindlessness, carelessness, thoughtlessness, unconsciousness even, indifference, abandon, dematerialize, drop out of sight, be lost, fade away, leave no trace. And that leave no trace is the trace and the leave no trace. I think it's the, you know, the desire and the fear. Very that beautiful. Are. It's great to have this list. I mean, it's a fantastic answer. Here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and this comes from the Tesauros. Yes. How beautiful. So shall we see? So I, I filmed, maybe I'll show you this. That's the data zone, what is it? And you wrote actually, <coughs> to, to, hold to hold in the mind. To hold in the mind, it's a very beautiful title. Yes, so this is where I, I film people. You know, I'm in it, in some of the roles and I never do choreography. I like very simple movements. I ask the people to just go together in a row and um, wanted actually to give the viewer a viewpoint of a scientist. I call it data zone and data, again, it's an erased data, you know, but it's, it's generic culture dishes, generic petri dishes. And for me, it was very, very important that it's a real person that I always feel that even if I erase a lot of identifying and it goes yeah. from one middle, something remains that you can, you know, you can identify with. Maybe you can feel that you have something in common with, you know. 
maybe more than a very perfect animation of a person. And they were all about, you know, order and disorder. Um, it's also interesting that there is, because we spoke about that yesterday with Ian Chang, who, you know, works with digital simulations, and he was saying, you know, there was always with film and video, we were kind of in this prison of, you know, a beginning and an end. And, it was, and, and I always felt with your works, when one sees them in a museum or in an exhibition, that it's actually, in a way, infinite, no? It doesn't... Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, call, I always try to avoid a narrative and also significance in yeah. some way. And I call, I call those work situations. Mm -hmm. It's a situation. And, and maybe there was another one that has to do with text that I will show, which has to do with the beginning with people, if that's the one. So I filmed 50 people in the age of 50 in Russia, 50 people. This is in Israel in a quarry. I'm there. And that's the row of people. And then I filmed 50 people in the age of 50 in Romania. Maybe they were not 50, but I say that they were 50. <laughs> and there was a bear and a man, and I filmed the bear, and then, it, you know, and then I filmed 50 people in the age of 50 in Russia. And I asked them, all of them, to hold hands while walking, to create some kind of a human chain, connection, row. That row then became the fundamental of the first text that I made. I wanted to make a total environment in a room they were like a wallpaper, and there were about 30,000 figures walking. This uh, work, uh, we don't have sound here for some reason, but this work uh, was a basis of uh, some of the text, but also a work, a memorial that uh, Norman Foster and I uh, made a proposal for, which I'll show you later. I call it Time Left. It's a work that I did just after September 11, and for me, it's an unresolved text about humanity. This connects directly to this. Connects directly to this. So how did you then translate this into a book when Elena invited you to do a book in this series? And I think it's the same, you know, when you have an exhibition space in which exhibition happen again and again, Artists are very aware of what artists did previously in terms of a gallery gesture. And I think that's always to do with the format. And of course, what Elena defined with this series, as Elena explained, the artist can choose the color, and the only given is really the format. But you've done something no one has ever done, which is actually, you know, here you wrap the space. And this is also a very immersive experience. It's potentially a whole space opens. Can you tell us how? you reacted to this invitation to do a book in this series? It took a long time to, to, see, to decide what I will do with that. Um, you know, I, I was going to, to do a book of pictures of, of the farm and my animals, you know, and the, that everything that I do, which is not called publicly out. I was going to do a book about that, you remember, Elena, which I showed you at some point. And then it became so obvious to me that since the first show I did with Ivory Press was all about books, all about texts, all about you know notebooks, vitrines, uh, a marriage between light and a stone on, on, on the subject of text. I, I do have a little documentation of this exhibition. It became clear to me that it will well, it is a, a, an opportunity for me to make a book of, of sort of like my writings, my, my, my this kind of digital writings. Uh, every mark, every line, every dot in this is a human. It's all recording of human. There is nothing that is not a human. Um, <laughs> can show it. <laughs> That's upside down, but it's okay. Can it it, it can be around. upside down. Why not? So I hold it here. And maybe you can then pull this one out. Yeah, we put this one out. And then we can all this. Okay. And then we can have an accordion. Yeah, as Anthony Pauls, his books do furnish a room. It's a room opens. It's a whole space. And it's interesting because, Next of course, time. it yes. has to do with repetition. And you've always loved repetition. I remember when I came to your studio. You, you told me about repetition, to see something again and again. You said, 
I found in the notes, actually, and also in the previous interview you gave, that you always said that it's a, the, the key movement in life is repetition. Or to quote you from an interview here with the Brooklyn Rail, it's a very basic movement in life, repetition. You repeat something to make it stronger, and you compare it to a, to a prayer. And it, of course, there's a whole book also by Deleuze. Deleuze wrote a book on repetition and difference. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of repetition in this book, but also in your work in, <coughs> in general, and how it connects to the, to the prayer? I think repetition is about taking a second look at something. And a second look at something in a, in a invites you to look at it again and look at it again, and then you kind of insist on look at it again, and then you look at it again in a different time unit. And sometimes you even, which art can do to, to a viewer, you kind of almost do a restart on your, you know, why do I see it again? And why do I see it? What's in it? You know, they go to, in, into some kind of, uh, but I guess I am interested in, in, in repetition. You know, it's, a, it's, it's because I work with movement and you want to hold time with the movement but I don't necessarily want to tell a story or a narrative. And then there's something that repeats, you know, the most maybe moving element of repetition that I was engaged with was when I did uh, the first chapter to the Museum of Holocaust in Jerusalem, where I was asked to, um, you know, to dedicate it to the Jewish life in Europe before the, the Shoah, before the Holocaust. And I worked with, you know, I, I, I gathered, they gathered from all archives in the world, segments and photographs and pieces of video. Uh, and I decided to, to mend them together and to make some kind of like a collage to rebuild a place in which these footage, pieces of footage will live again. And some of them were very, very short moments. And so I, I repeated those moments. You know, you see a woman that is making the bed and she's making the bed again. She's, as the film goes like that, like a scroll, she's making the bed. And, and then it became like, you know, a moment that would never develop anywhere. It has a certain quality of a photograph. It has a certain depth in it because it, it will never go elsewhere, but it still has a life. So something about that kind of threshold between death and life that is, is there. That's about repetition. And then there is the mark and the sign, because of course, this book, uh, this marvelous publication, Writings, has a lot to do with your interest in, in writings, in visual gestures, in visual languages. And you say that you're always moved when you look at the mark, when you look at the sign, and you see this as a, a kind of a urge to, to communicate. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, when, sure. I, my, my fascinated with fascination with language started when I was a girl. I actually uh, invented uh, uh, a language, you know, with a friend of mine. She has the book. I have to get it back from her, of all the new letters. And but I was always very fascinated with it, especially texts that I cannot decipher, that I don't know what's in it. But you know, the the, the gesture, the act of acting, the act of writing. Uh, and of course, if we go back in time, you know, it starts from the, the, the prehistory. It's kind of a drawing also. It's kind of a writing also. It's a writing of an image. But later on with the history, the urge to, to really leave a mark, to, to engrave something, to keep it, and to keep, you know, to keep the, the whole story of engravement in front of a, a reality that is so fluid, so flux, that is there is always a sense of instability that actually is growing and growing and growing. So the, there is this fascination with text and it's, it's always getting, taking on uh, a new form because you know if you look at the, those, those early texts that are, are you know, about an engravement, about putting in a stone effect that is so factual, that is so, you know, so, so like engraved and I come with light, which is no, min no medium, no material. The light turns off, it's gone. It's you know, a reality that is all the time changing. And if we look at what's going on in the world now, that it, it, we even lost our handwriting. It's the binary language. And 
we are becoming microchips in, in you know, in new language that is just, you know, plus and minus or black, or black and white. And uh, it's multi-systems of communication and, uh, and, 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 you know, all these barcodes and cloning and repetitions. And, you know, it's very hard to decipher where we are with, with, with this new way of, of communication. And anyway, I never stop. I always call my writing the blah blah, blah blah notebook, blah blah notebook too. I never thought that reality can be fully translated into words. And it's interesting and you mentioned. I met recently, yes. I'm having a dialogue with a professor who was the head of studies of Jewish philosophy, you know, Kabbalah and all of that. He wrote an encyclopedia of 14 volumes. And last Saturday, he said to me, I'm withdrawing from people who think that everything can be translated into words. So it's a fascination, but a disbelief at the same time. But it's interesting also that you talk to people in many different disciplines. And uh, of course, this idea, particularly for the current moment in our world, it seems so important that we break down silos, no? that we connect art, I mean, as you do, to science, to li yeah. linguistics, to to literature, as we both do, and of course, uh, Elena Foster wrote this wonderful book on salons, where we can learn, you know, how salons actually brought historically, you know, different disciplines mm -hmm. into contact and broke down silos. Now, you've done lots of collaborations, not only the one you just described, but you did, for example, wonderful collaborations, and this goes back to books, um, with the writer David Grossman. Can you tell us about that, about the dialogue and the books that produced? Yes, we this incredible children book with drawings. Yeah, we started with a book called The Hug, which is a children book, but it's also like a very philosophical book um, about being alone and together. As a, I'll tell you a few lines from the book, so you know the book. She, the mother walks in the street, in the in the field with the son, and his name is Ben. It could be uh, Ben is the name for any son, a child. And she says, you're so wonderful. There is no one like you in the whole world. And he says, really, there is no one like me? And he's a bit concerned. And he says, she says, no, of course not. And he says, why there is only one like me in the whole world? I don't want to be only one like me in the whole world. And he, she says, why not? It's wonderful that you are unique and special. And he says, but I feel alone like that. And you know, it goes on and on. It's, it's this book like that. And so we decided to, David asked to do a project together and I, I then uh, drew it like a child would draw, because anyway, I, I, <laughs> I sort of, I don't know how to draw, and I draw like a child, you know? It's, uh, I, it came out like that, my assistant said it's very nice, and I said to them, it's so childish, and they said, yeah, but it's very nice, and then David said it's very nice, and we came up with it, and I, I, I rewrote his uh, text in, in my handwriting, and so it became the, the first book, and the second one, was there was another one, and then David wrote the David Grossman wrote the text for my catalog of uh, the Louvre exhibition, and the project Macom, which involved working with Palestinians, Israelis, Israelis uh, with dismantled, ruined, destroyed houses that we reconstructed into new structures that very much remind the first work that you asked me about those cubic structures in Erodion. And the last thing we did was with some musicians is a film called The Situation, about the situation in Israel and the hope to have a, um, a better situation, so that, like a, a video clip. So that's a collaboration with uh, David Grossman. Then there is, of course, also collaborations with composers. You've built bridges to, between art and music. I know of the collaboration with Philip Glass, and there is also the collaboration with, with Heiner Goebbels. Can you tell us about these two? Collaborations. Yeah, Philip Klapp was, was a very important uh, moment for me because, um, you know, I thought that he will give me a piece of music and I will then do a video clip the way it is and with such a musician that I, I adore, they f of course, with the repetition and change, uh, it makes sense, you know? Serial music, it connects, yeah, ta -ta 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 -ta, you know, it's like I'm also ta 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 ta, -ta you know? Da -da 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 -da. And so, so, uh, he said, no, I would actually like you to make a, a short film and I will make a concert for it, a short concert for it. And I thought, 
okay, if I work with Philip Glass, it, I have to, I have an opportunity, like in every special project, to expand and to go elsewhere with my work. And I decided then to write notes. And I, you know, I made a drawing of the five lines. I placed some people on the lines. And before that, we decided that we are not going to put it together and we are postmodern and it's not cool and every time the music if it will repeat it will be on another moment and but then in the end they really played it to the note you know so there were it was called notes and that was the that uh, collaboration and, and with Heiner with Heiner it was for the exhibition I I had at the Jeu de Pomme it was sort of a retrospective and there was the room for the last piece which actually was shown also in Ivory Press, which was filled with fire. I went to the oil fields in Kazakhstan because I saw that the oil is the mythological hero of our time. It was back then for sure. Uh, I can argue about it. It was the mythological hero. Um, just as a, and so I, but I didn't find anything. It was em kind of empty landscape, deserted, but there was some pipes with gas layer of gas that came out of, of the earth. And I recorded, I filmed and recorded the fire. The <laughs> a little bit like Cunelis, you know, gas when walks. The, and yeah, <laughs> when the pieces Yes, that I saw now. Fire, yeah. Yes, I, I, and so Heiner then took the sound, the bad recording that I had. And, um, and I created this kind of distressed landscape of instability, very abstract, no people. Um, yes. And Elena showed it. it was a big undertake to show it here. To get the special sound system, it was never good enough for me. And it was had to get a better one and a better one and a projector and a better one. And right, Elena? <laughs> I often say, uh, yes. I often, if I, if I don't forget, I often say, uh, where before an exhibition, I say to the person, I just want to let you know I'm a nightmare. <laughs> and then sometimes the they agree with me in the end. So that was that. And of course with Verdi, Trovatore. Yeah, I want to hear about your Verdi <laughs> collaboration uh, across time. That was amazing because I, I, I was doing a project in the train station in Napoli with, with Alvaro Cesar, you know, it was a big train project, 35 meters by five, some kind of a fresco video. And the opera house decided they'd like to do a, an opera with me and I said to them listen it's not not really uh, not my medium there's so much in opera first of all there is a story and I don't like to tell the story and there is the costumes and the singers and all the background the backdrops and there is oh, you know you don't you know this is too much already for me and and so they asked me they said we have a great espresso and why don't you bring one thing and we will just project it and you will see, you know, just for, for your experience. And I, I happened to bring a landscape, which was a red landscape with a cypress tree and people going along that kind of landscape in these mountains. And I, show, I showed it and, at the, the, you know, it was a beautiful opera house. Everything is red velvet and the gold. And when I came, the dancers were dancing. I was a dancer once, by the way. And they said, Senora Rovner Arriva. So everybody went from the and they went off the stage and the red thing went and they played Maria Callas on the pink wings of love, you know, where she sings to her lover. And it was like that and, was, ah. and so that's how I, I was drawn. And it's, you know, it was a, a, an amazing, I really thought that I, I am, I have a great opportunity to collaborate. It's a collaboration, even though it's not a, here, not alive, not this and this and that. It really was a collaboration. But there's also the collaboration with animals. And um, this morning you told me that um, you actually often draw donkeys, particularly also when you travel and you're not yes. with your donkeys. And of course, that leads us to something very important, which I think we need to talk about, because this dialogue with animals, it's something Etelat Nan always points out. She says, you know, we need to learn 
today to learn not only to listen to each other, but also to listen to animals, to listen to plants, have conversations with plants, hug trees. And so you've said uh, in relation to the farm that it's the coming and going aspect to existence that I'm interested in. It's very interesting in relation also to your, to your work, this coming and going. You said, I'm a farmer and I regularly see the processes of life sprouting from the ground and on to the land. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about, because particularly also because you told us that initially when Elena invited you to do this book, the writings book, your first idea was to do something about the farm, about, so that's maybe a future book, because it's nice, one book always leads to the next book. That's the beautiful thing, I think, about um, uh, the, the, the obsession or passion for books, that it's never ending. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about this and the farm and the drawings of animals, the dialogues you have with animals. I am, first of all, uh, if you talk about identity, in Israel I'm listed as a farmer, and which I'm very proud of, and I, I do farm. I, I have olive trees and olive oil and, and, and organic vegetables and all of that, but I do need to have animals around me. I need that kind of a dial non-verbal dialogue. Uh, I have donkeys because they are one of them, the main donkey, is called Nof. Uh, Nof means landscape in Hebrew. And he is the landscape. He's part of the landscape. You know that I'm creating a landscape there with the stones and all of this. The donkey really makes sense. It's a very biblical. It's a kind of a Canaan landscape with, with passes and, and so on. And then I have uh, some dogs. But the most fascinating one is, is the project that I'm working on now, I would say. I'm mostly invested. It's almost to, in, an, in an animal that it's becoming almost unethical for my work because of the time it takes. And I have an, you know, a, a small dog, a puppy, which is completely wild from the desert. It was raised in, a, in, a ta you know, in, the, in the earth in a tunnel, like a fox or like a wolf or like a jackal. It's some kind of a mixture of something like that. Uh, completely suspecting people, completely, completely wild, a uh, fascinating animal. It's a she, I, called her, I call her Bar. Bar means wild. And you know, recently, she even, she even waves the tail at me. She even come across, but she would never let me get close to her more than one and a half meters. And it's, you know, it's so fascinating that, you know, the, the need to express, express affection with a touch, with a communication like that. And for her, it's the absolute distance, you know, that needs to stay there. And the jackal entered the work also. The Do you have images of that here? It could be nice to see. The jackal. Well, I hope I find it. Because I, it said the jackal is watching us. I, I, it was a time when there was a lot of terror attacks in, in the world. And I spent a few months in dark fields, and I waited to to meet the jackals. Uh, because, you know, I hear them in the day around, uh, and they howl at night. That's one of the jackals. It's kind of was alongside mapping uh, the old phenomena of dislocation. So it was like the jackal <coughs> that in mythology was Anubis, who was actually the guardian between life and death. He was guarding the soul to eternity, and so he was the gatekeeper. And you cannot, you cannot film a video at night unless you bring a, a, a you have to bring a, a camera, and you have to bring light, and they will run away then. And well, there are some of the images, you know. I'll just do this. That's beautiful. And also, actually, you know, it reminds me of the hieroglyphs in, in Egypt. I was thinking about that this morning, actually. And that is something I always wanted to ask you, because I once read that about 30, more than 30 years ago, you went on a trip with your parents yes. to Egypt. And you said that was another of these epiphanies, a really incredibly important experience. 
And it's there that you saw these hieroglyphs with jackals. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened on that trip with your parents to, to Egypt? Because it seems to have had a big impact on your later work, no? Yeah, I, I, if I, I think in many, many aspects it has a great impact mm -hmm. on my work. But of course, you know, it started from the pyramid that I came there and I, I just started to have tears. You know, I'm, I, I never cry like that, you know. My parents don't see me crying. We are like tough, rough Israelis, you know, humor. And suddenly I just started to have a lot of tears coming, just being there. It was, I don't know, it's a very strong experience. And then I saw those, you know, I recall the wonderful sentence of Napoleon. And he said to the soldiers, think about it, soldiers, from these pyramids, three, 1,300 years of history are looking at you. And, uh, and then I, there were all these, these uh, white wolf-like dogs that later on I, I traced, and this is the kind of dog that I have. And they were walking around by themselves, almost there. And then, of course, all the, all the texts, it all really fascinated me. The text, the Egyptian text, the hieroglyphs, uh, you know, all these objects that from that point and on, you know, I, I used to say at that moment, I decided that the museum in, in Egypt is my favorite museum, but everywhere I go in the world, I like to go to archeological museums. Uh, and I'm not interested in the specific of the information, but, but I, I love to see all these objects. Even when I had a show in the, in the Louvre, I asked to be alone at night with, in the department of old antiquity that starts, you know, from Mesopotamia to Egypt the two places where history began, where text began, along the Syrian-African break, where Israel is somewhere in the middle, almost in the same time, almost, you know, the text began in two places. And so Egypt was, 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 of course, opened the door for me. And when you see all these objects with, with erased arms, erased heads, some of the missing text, you realize that even they are broken and missing a lot of information. There is life particles in them that I felt. And of course, these jackals are you know, filmed at night. And you told me before that there was were moments when you didn't sleep. I also had moments when I didn't sleep. Now I sleep, and you also sleep. But can you tell us about that? Because you, at some point, you had one day a week where you wouldn't sleep. I was fascinated by that. Yeah, in New York, I tried to, to skip a day a week. Because I, I, was always, I always had a battle with time, you know, with, with, with wanting to do so much and realizing it's, you know, I'm a bit uh, pro fanatic about production, you know, every day I, I, I said, did, did I do this, ta, 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 you know? Sometimes, you know, even if I have a, a, an inspiring meeting, I don't need to do anything, you know, because I have an inspiring meeting or a view or a site or, or, or something. But usually I, I uh, like that. So I, I did that. It was, uh, it worked for a while. And then I moved into very short sleeps, which I still do. You know, if I, if I manage to take a nap of 20 minutes, it can set me up. But time catches up with you. That's what Da Vinci did. He slept every three hours for 15 minutes. Yes. Rumor has it, yeah. yeah. And Napoleon. <laughs> also, you know, Napoleon had uh, uh, short naps. Now, we cannot talk about everything because I promised Elena that it will not be a marathon. Uh, and you've done so much, you know, extraordinary projects we could talk about. But there is actually... Exactly. Which we're going two different ways. Yes, I will. Yeah, let's talk about these drawings. I, because it's, I also think that Elena is right. It's very important to talk about these drawings. I, uh, I was asked to create a room in memory of the million and a half Jewish children from 0 to 15 who were murdered or died in the Holocaust, in the Shoah. And actually, it's. If you look at Israel now, it's the entire number of children from zero to 15. It's almost the same number of, if you take all the children in Israel, it's about a million and a half children. Uh, and so it is, it is very hard to even imagine, even one child or two. Or, you know. And so I, 
I, di I, I didn't want to do this project. You know, I refrained. And they asked me again, and they asked me again, and they like, you can do it. And I said, no, I cannot do a room about the murder of the children. And then, in the end, I thought that I don't have to do anything about the murdering of children, but I actually would like to get as close to the children as possible. You know, these children were erased from the war, erased. They didn't leave a mark, they didn't leave anything, almost, except they left drawings. And I was looking for their voices, and I was looking for their, their drawings. Um, uh, I, I think it's not the, the right setting to, I don't know if I'll even be able to find it here. But I ended up staying, um, I ended up staying five and a half months in Auschwitz, and I redrew their last drawings, their testimonies, and Did it- Stay alone at night? I stayed from the day, from the morning till very late at night, and the people usually all go, at three o'clock it's mandatory. They are forced to leave at three, uh, but I said I need to stay longer, so I had the key and I went to the, you know, to the block, Dvadice Shedem. I spoke a little Polish even, and at night I would read all the books about, you know, related to the subject. Um, but I read through their last drawings, their, you know, their testimonies, and I, I realized, I, I don't know, I have it here. We can, we can keep it for, for our next conversation. I'll show it to you later. Did you do a book? I didn't do a book. It was, I didn't want to do anything else. I felt that I wanted to give the children a presence in the place where they were erased. I, I really redrew it with a pencil so it's erasable, the way children would draw on the wall. And you walk into a room and the room is empty and there's only those drawings that you finally see because they're, they're also very low and there is some voices of them and it took so much out of me, you know, uh, uh, each one or two I had to go and to rest. And after that, about half a year, I, I just was exhausted. My sister, she's a psychologist, she said, you are depressed. I said, no, I'm not depressed, I'm depleted. And, but it's a very... I remember that you went out of the world after that uh, project. I think that it affected you immensely. And you showed me and you made me listen the voices of the children yes. in the tapes in your studio. Yes. And how to since then, and that happened. Yes. Years ago. So imagine we if you are alone in Auschwitz with the drawings. I will show you to later. Huh? I'll show you to you later. I, 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 I will find it here, but you know, it's like boom, boom, boom. You know, I have to search it. Uh, uh, but anyway, you maybe, know. Because it's the first of I hopefully, wanted, yeah. You know what, what, what is it, just to close that, and, uh, and thank you for bringing this up, because it's very important. You know, it's the two times, the two works that I did, that I didn't want to erase anything, and I actually wanted to do it exactly the way it is. I did not want to uh, make it my own art. I, I just wanted to, be, uh, to serve something. But the fa fascinating thing that even on the verge of death and fear, even a child always have the need and the urge to leave a mark, to leave, a, you know, a testimony. So and that idea of the mark, you know, brings us then to the second book we have to talk about urgently, okay. because there is not only the artist book you, you did for the series, and that's uh, a book which is basically published in a bigger edition, so it's distributed in bookstores, but Ivory Press has very different kinds of books. There are these very, very, very special books also in smaller editions, mm -hmm. which are really at the same time also uh, rooms, which are spaces. It's very much what Anthony Powell says, that you know, books can become spaces. Um, and this book you, you actually created, document, brings together almost everything we've been discussing in today's interview. It, it's, you talked about the marks, you talked about your interest in text, you talked about the interest in typography. We talked a lot about layers of time. You know, in today, you, you mentioned the different layers of time. And of course, Rauschenberg, uh, Robert Rauschenberg once told me, you know, art, uh, art history talks much more about space than about time. It's kind of a strange missing art history, you know, the history of time. Um, so we 
time is there. You know, we talked about the fluidity, we talked about the light. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of, of document? Because in a way, I these books are almost, I mean, James E. Bios once said that his dream was always to do a book which is the, the perfect object. And in a way, these books, you know, it's the same for Olaf for Eliasson's book, uh, these books, very often made out of unusual materials, are very long-term projects. They often take years in the making. Um, uh, and I was just curious about how your process was uh, from the first idea and to hear more about, about document. Because also there are the layers, because when actually, as you say, one detects situations in the book, it's not only layers of time, but one also detects situations which have to do with what's happening in the world right now, because we live in a world of, of uh, a migration, uh, you know, mass migration, and, and uh, that's all in that book. It's, it's multi, multi layered. Mm -hmm. So the, the process started with Elena asking me to do an artist book and showing me the first artist books when I had a show here 2007. And since then, Elena, again, from time to time said, would you like to do an artist book? And you know, I never, I saw all these objects and they were, you know, they, they, they were very beautiful, but there was, they, they were very much an, you know, art object. There was sometimes uh, art in capital A, you know, for, for good, but not my kind of art, which I try to not have sometimes, even though sometimes it is capital A, but sometimes I try not to be capital A. Like art, you know. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I didn't know what special object and special object. And then, you know, again and Elena. But Elena really is the one who pulled this book out of me and said maybe special material, maybe like this and maybe like that. And there was, you know, to the point that I, I absolutely said I have to do the book. And uh, this, it was an, her insistence. Otherwise, this would never be realized. It wasn't like I was going to do this, you know. I wasn't. I do from time to time vitrines with notebooks, but not exactly this one, which, you know, we already had papers like this in the exhibition at Ivory Press, and they were on the floor, which I call them, also I think I call them documents. Documents, you know, like the human documents, kind of always made sense to me that writings is such a human activity that it has to be represented by, by humans. And so, and the paper, the material, I wanted to give it volume somewhat the way Elena was describing an object. So, and also for myself thinking about, you know, Dead Sea Scrolls, parchments, all these objects found, you know, that uh, I'm always fascinated by, and the, the, the desire to recover information to recover, but also the fact that you can mix two layers of time, layers of time, because I always like to mix times in my work. Very often I would take footage from, you know, history and uh, current time and, you know, etc., etc. And then there is also another thing which I found striking, which is basically the fact that it's matter, uh, and it's, it's matter, but it's also uh, light. So it's immaterial and material at the same time. So it's a kind of an oxymoron. Yes, because I always say, you know, people, I always say, you know, when, if you would ask me what is my material, I'm an artist, what is my material? My material is light. It's a kind of a non-material material. It's only reflections of a reality that is, is, is moving all the time and changing. And then, you know, the moment you record it, also as a photograph, there is always this the same urge to engrave something, you know, to capture, to engrave something. Uh, but that thing with the video, I like about it that, you know, I hate and like that it's so unreliable. People say that I'm a very technological artist. I'm absolutely not, you know. Sometimes I don't even know where the button on and off is. And, you know, and, and there is a saying, you know, Malcolm McLuhan said when I studied, I remember cinema and television. I remember, see, Ma, Ma, he said, the medium is the message. And I always say the medium is not the message. The message is the message. And the medium, you know, I'm now in 2020, whatever. There is video. I'm working with video. And, you know, next time, who knows what? 
That's a wonderful conclusion. I have actually one last question, and it's interesting. I mean, McLuhan also said that art is an early alarm system which allows us to prepare, you know, to cope with these new developments. And I think it's interesting. We talked a lot today about, of course, you know, your, your photography, your, your videos. We talked about the books, which are the center of the exhibition. Here, we talked about your drawings. Uh, we talked about the farm as a kind of a, a Gesamtkunstwerk. There's one thing we haven't touched upon, which I wanted to end on, which is your public work. And I think it's very important, the idea of public sculpture in, in your work. And uh, the other day, you know, I, I went really early one morning to the office in London at the Serpentine, and as it was out of opening hours, you know, somebody asked me if I would work there, because obviously, you know, it would be not opening hours. I said, yes. So he said he always wanted to talk to someone who works at the Serpentine to tell us the story of his daughter because he came on a walk one, uh, one Sunday and suddenly his daughter ran into the pavilion and she had an epiphany and you know, now wants to become an architect. Mm -hmm. And then I asked him you know, if he had also visited the exhibitions because of course it's free admission as the whole museum mile you know, across in a way the Serpentine, it's a natural history museum, the B&A. All the collections is free admission. It's a great thing about London. There's so much, you know, free admission. And he said, no, 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 it would never have occurred to him. And he's never been to a museum ever in his life. Um, and then I said, why? And then there was this silence. It was very strange. And then he said, listen, it's just because we think, you know, museums are not for people like us. And so this idea that there is still, even if there is free admission, this, in a way, um, threshold, means that it's very, very important that with art, we go to people, and as we believe in the transformatory or transformative power of art, I think it is important to do public artworks, the pavilion is such, but also kind of public installations, public commissions, which you often do, are of course such an opportunity, because you reach people like this daughter, you know, who is 14, 15 years old, and they can change their life, but the parents would never take them necessarily to a museum. Now, you've done most recently, we don't have the time to talk about all your public commission, but you've done most recently an extraordinary work for Canary Wharf. And it's also very complimentary because we talked about the farm and the countryside. That is a very urban work, and it's a portrait of a city. Oskar Kokoschka always said it's impossible to paint the city almost because whenever you think you capture it, it's already changed. How did you make a portrait of a city? And it has also a sound. Maybe we can see images of that to and conclude, no? First of all, it's wonderful that you brought up all the, the notion of public art because I, I, uh, I always, you know, I, I said that in, for this work, I have an opportunity to communicate to the CEOs of the biggest banks in London, in Canary Wharf, and to the women who come to clean the place, which is a beautiful site built by Foster and Partners that I was very inspired by all these la layers of, and so, you know, I, I always want to be understood. I, I don't want to do, to, to do something to, too abstract and too undec undeciphered for people who are, you know, the public people. And, I, and that was an opportunity for me to kind of encapsulate London the monu you know, the city of so much theater and monuments which are evidence for a very dramatic history, but also the, the train that kind of risen to, to this whole project, which was the, the human movement in time. So we talked about your to collaboration with, you know, with music, with literature. Here we have your collaboration with architecture. Yes, with Norman architecture. Foster. With Norman, we had a very great project that I still hope will be realized one day.
that's actually incredibly timely that you would say that because my very last question, which is the only recurring question in all my conversations, is always about the unrealized project. Because we know a great deal about architects' unrealized projects because they actually, luckily, they publish them so we can see them. But we know almost nothing about artists' unrealized projects. If we have two minutes, I will show you our proposal, which I think is the most radical thing for an architect to do here. I can remember going to the cinema, the Pathé News. The only news I can remember was the liberating of the camps. The skeletal prisoners, the striped uniforms, the barbed wire, the silence. I had a challenge to create a room in memory of the million and a half Jewish children murdered in the Shoah. I spent a few months in Auschwitz redrawing their last drawings, their testimonies. There is an urge to overcome time and death, to fill up in some way the endless void of loss and absence. The entrance is marked by a sculpture of books, evocative of the 1933 Act that started the burning of books. It's a journey down a ramp into the earth, evocative of the rail tracks that take you to the death camps, to the concentration camps. Also of those routes that took you to the gas chambers. The destination is a memorial. Michal Rovner in her extraordinary, symbolic, endless procession of people. Or is it a script? Does it record the testimonies of the survivors? It's ambiguous. You move through, you come to the light, to the sky, to normality. This journey is about the past, but more importantly, it's about a future. In time left, there will be nearly 60,000 figures walking. I erase their identifying details so it can be anybody. It could be them. It can be us.